Before the 1973 Supreme Court decision legalizing abortion in the United States, abortion was a crime. Some abortions were medically licensed, but they were a minute percentage of the abortions actually undergone by women. This meant that there were no records of illegal abortions performed. Each abortion was a crime. Each abortion was clandestine. No medical histories or records, no statistics. Information on illegal abortions came from these sources. Number one, the testimonies of women who had had such abortions and survived. Number two, the physical evidence of the botched abortions, evidence that showed up in hospital emergency rooms all over the country every single day, perforated uteruses, infections including gangrene, severe hemorrhaging, incomplete abortions in which fetal tissue is left in the womb, always fatal if not removed. Number three, the physical evidence of dead bodies. For instance, nearly one half of the maternal deaths in New York State resulted from illegal abortions. And number four, the anecdotal reminiscence of doctors who were asked for help by desperate women. These sources provide a profile of the average woman who wanted and got an illegal abortion. Indisputably, she was married and had children. It has been repeatedly demonstrated that most criminal abortions today are obtained by married women with children, wrote Jerome E. Bates and Edward S. Zawoski in Criminal Abortion, published in 1964. An estimated two-thirds of the women who got criminal abortions were married. This means that up to two-thirds of the botched abortions were done on married women, up to two-thirds of the dead were married women, perhaps two-thirds of the survivors are married women. This means that most of the women who risked death or maiming so as not to bear a child were married, perhaps one million married women each year. They were not shameless sluts, unless all women by definition are. They were not immoral in traditional terms, though even then they were thought of as promiscuous and single. Nevertheless, they were not women from the streets, but women from homes. They were not daughters in the homes of fathers, but wives in the homes of husbands. They were, quite simply, the good and respectable women of America. The absolute equation of abortion with sexual promiscuity is a bizarre distortion of the real history of women in abortion, too distorted to be acceptable even in the United States, where historical memory reaches back one decade. Abortion has been legalized just under one decade. The fact should not be obliterated yet. Millions of respectable, God-fearing married women have had illegal abortions. They thank their God that they survived, and they keep quiet. Their reasons for keeping quiet are women's reasons. Because they are women, their sexuality, or even perceptions of it, can discredit or hurt or destroy them, inexplicably shame them, provoking rage, rape, and ridicule in men. Dissociation from other women is always the safest course. They are not sluttish, but other women who have had abortions probably are. They tried not to get pregnant, birth control being illegal in many parts of the country before 1973, but other women who had abortions probably did not. They love their children, but other women who have had abortions may well have been cold mothers, the cruel mothers, the vicious women. They are individuals of worth and good morals who had compelling reasons for aborting, but the other women who had abortions must have done something wrong were wrong, are somehow indistinct, not emerged from the primal female slime as individuals, were sex, not persons. In keeping the secret, they cut themselves off from other women to escape the shame of other women, the shame of being the same as other women, the shame of being female. They are ashamed of having had this bloody experience, of having this female body that gets torn into again and again, and bleeds and can die from the tearing and the bleeding, the pain and the mess, of having this body that was violated again, this time by abortion. Admitting to an illegal abortion is like admitting you have been raped. Whoever you tell can see you, undress you, spread your legs, see the thing go in, see the blood, watch the pain, almost touch the fear, almost taste the desperation. The woman who admits to having had an illegal abortion allows whoever hears her to picture her, her as an individual in that wretched body, in unbearable vulnerability, as close to being punished purely for being female as anyone ever comes. It is the picture of a woman being tortured for having had sex. There is the fear of having murdered, not someone, not real murder, but having done something hauntingly wrong. She has learned, learned is a poor word for what has happened to her, that every life is more valuable than her own. Her life gets value through motherhood, a kind of benign contamination. She has been having children in her mind and getting her value through them since she herself was a baby. Little girls believe that dolls are real babies. Little girls put dolls to sleep, feed them, bathe them, diaper them, nurse them through illnesses, teach them how to walk and how to talk and how to dress, Love them. Abortion turns a woman into a murderer, all right. She kills that child pregnant in her since her own childhood. She kills her allegiance to motherhood first. This is a crime. She is guilty of not wanting a baby. There is the fear of having murdered because so many men believe so passionately that she has. To many men, each aborted pregnancy is the killing of a son, and he's the son killed. His mother would have killed him if she had had the choice. These men have a peculiarly retroactive and abstract sense of murder. 
If she had had a choice, I would not have been born, which is murder. The male ego, which refuses to believe in its own death, now pushes backward, before birth. I was once a fertilized egg, therefore to abort a fertilized egg is to kill me. Women keep abortion secret because they are afraid of the hysteria of men confronted with what they regard as the specter of their own extinction. If you had your way, men say to feminists, my mother would have aborted me, killed me. I was born out of wedlock and against the advice that my mother received from her doctor, Jesse Jackson writes in fervent opposition to abortion, and therefore abortion is a personal issue for me. The woman's responsibility to the fertilized egg is imaginatively and with great conviction construed to be her relation to the adult male. At the very least, she must not murder him, nor should she outrage his existence by an assertion of her separateness from him, her distinctness, her importance as a person independent from him. The adult male's identification with the fertilized egg as being fully himself can even be conceptualized in terms of power, his rightful power over an impersonal female, all females being the same in terms of function. The power I had as one cell to affect my environment I shall never have again, R.D. Lying laments in an androcentric meditation on pre-birth ego. My environment is a woman. The adult male, even as a fertilized egg, one cell, has the right of occupation with respect to her. He has the right to be inside her and the rightful power to change her body for his sake. This relation to gestation is specifically male. Women do not think of themselves in utero when they think either of being pregnant or of aborting. Men think of pregnancy and abortion primarily in terms of themselves, including what happened or what might have happened to them back in the womb when, as one cell, they were themselves. Women keep quiet about abortions they have had, illegal abortions, because they are humiliated by the memory of those abortions. They are humiliated by the memory of their desperation, the panic, finding the money, finding the abortionist, the dirt, the danger, the secrecy. Women are humiliated when they remember asking for help, begging for help, when they remember those who turned them away, left them out in the cold. Women are humiliated by the memory of the fear. Women are humiliated by the memory of the physical intrusion, the penetration, the pain, the violation. Countless women were sexually assaulted by the abortionist before or after the abortion. They hate remembering. Women are humiliated because they hated themselves, their sex, their female bodies. They hated being female. Women hate remembering illegal abortions because they almost died. They could have died. They wanted to die. They hoped they would not die. They made promises to God begging him not to let her die. They were afraid of dying before, during, and after. They have never again been so afraid of death or so alone. They had never before been so afraid of death or so alone. And women hate remembering illegal abortions because their husbands experience none of this, which no woman forgives. Women also keep quiet about illegal abortions precisely because they had married sex. Their husbands mounted them, fucked them, impregnated them. The husbands determined the time and the place and the act. Desire, pleasure, or orgasm were not necessarily experienced by the woman, yet the woman ended up on the butcher's block. The abortionist finished the job the husband had started. No one wants to remember this. Women also keep quiet about abortions they have had because they wanted the child, but the man did not, because they wanted other children and could not have them, because they never regretted the abortion and did regret subsequent children, because they had more than one abortion which, like more than one rape, fixes the woman's guilt. Women keep quiet about abortions because abortion inside marriage is selfish, ruthless, marks the woman as heartless, loveless, yet she did it anyway. Women also keep quiet about abortions they have had, illegal abortions, because the woman who has had one, or tried to induce one in herself, is never really trusted again. If she will do that to herself, hurt herself, tear up her own insides rather than have a child, she must be the frenzied female, the female gone mad, the lunatic female, the female in rebellion against her own body and therefore against man and God, the female who is most feared and abhorred, the Medea underneath the devoted wife and mother, the wild woman, the woman enraged with sorrow between her legs, the woman grief-stricken by the way men use her uterus, the woman who has finally refused to be forced, and so she must be punished by the pain and the blood, the tearing and the terror. The law gives a married woman to her husband to be fucked at will, his will. The law forced the woman to bear any child that might result. Illegal abortion was a desperate, dangerous, last-ditch, secret, awful way of saying no. It is no wonder that so many respectable, married, God-fearing women hate abortion.